Hi, I'm Patrick with DirecTV's Technical Training Department, and for the next few minutes, we're going to take a closer look at routing and attaching cable. We'll explain why it's so important to use proper cable and proper attachment devices, and we'll also take a closer look at some techniques for routing and attaching cable for the best performance and appearance. First, let's take a look at the cable. The cables we use to install a DirecTV system are a vital part of the system. The way we route and attach them is critical to the performance and appearance of the installation. The RG6 cable we use not only transports the signal from the LMB to the receiver, it also delivers the voltage from the receiver to power the LMB. Because we're counting on the cable to pass both high frequencies and voltage, it is vital that the right cable be used. Many installers don't realize the cable currently being used by most cable TV companies isn't capable of passing the voltages we need to properly operate our LMBs. Though cable TV has been around a lot longer than direct to home satellite service and both provide programming services, the two are very different. Direct TV generally uses frequencies between 900 and 1450 MHz and passes voltage to power the LMB. Cable TV generally uses frequencies between 54 MHz and 750 MHz and never passes voltage. This is because external power supplies throughout the cable system power all active cable components. These lower frequencies and the lack of voltage on the cable allow a cable TV company to use cable that may not work well in one of our installs. Unfortunately, the largest consumer of RG6 cable in the country is the cable TV industry. There's a lot of cable out there designed to work for their application that looks just like our cable. Make sure you are only using cable approved for satellite installation. If the wrong cable is used, the voltage drop can be too severe. If there's only a 4 volt drop, the LMB will not be able to switch. That means you don't get half of your channels. There is also the signal loss through the cable. Though most RG6 cable has relatively close attenuation, SBCA and DirecTV approved cable is consistent in its performance which improves overall system dependability. The SBCA, or Satellite Broadcasting and Communications Association, and DirecTV have standards for cable and connectors. These standards must be followed. The cable must be RG6 or larger with a minimum of 60% braid, 100% shielded, and have a solid copper center conductor. It must be approved by DirecTV. Connectors must also meet the standards of DirecTV and the SBCA. Only compression type connectors are approved for direct to home satellite installation. Both cables and connectors are covered in more detail in another session. Next, we'll take a closer look at the proper way to route cable. One of the primary considerations to be made while doing an installation is where to mount the ODU. Certainly the most important consideration is the line of sight. The next consideration is selecting a suitable mounting surface. Next, you'll need to determine where inside the home you'll need to route your cable. You'll also need to determine if there's a working telephone connection in close proximity to the receiver, and if not, how will you get a telephone connection to that location? In some cases, you may need to install a telephone outlet. All these considerations should be determined during your interior site survey. Once those considerations are made, you'll need to decide how and where you'll be routing the cable and the ground circuit. Routing the cable starts right at the LMB. Route the cables up through the arm and connect the cables to the LMB. Ideally, the antenna should be mounted in close proximity to the receiver. Sometimes this isn't possible because you can't get the cable between the two locations without creating a hazard or an eyesore. Hazards are created when cable is routed across doorways or within walkways. Eyesores are created when cable is routed across walls or in open areas. Every effort should be made to hide cables. When doing the site survey, you should be looking for places to route the cable that are not only out of sight but are protected. Routing cable in corners or against molding keeps it out of clear sight and protects it. You also need to consider the type of material you will be attaching to. 
This will determine the type of attachment device you use. Never use metal staples or a staple gun to attach cable to anything. If they damage the cable and they don't hold up in weather like an approved cable clip. Let's take a look at a few approved attachment devices and where they should be used. The most common is the cable clip. These come in a variety of styles to fit different types of cable. Cable clips are usually black or white and range in size to fit single coax, dual coax, or ground wire. Usually made of a nylon compound, these must be the exact diameter as the cable you are using. These attach to the structure by an incorporated nail or screw and should fit firmly around the cable. Care must be taken when hammering in a clip. One slip of the hammer and the cable could be damaged. There are clips designed for wood, masonry, or even aluminum and vinyl siding. Make sure you're using the right clip for the material you're attaching to. The masonry clip has a hardened steel nail that is designed to be driven into the masonry. This can be difficult to drive in without damaging the masonry or the cable. Often they chip out the masonry when you try to hammer them in. They can also bend. A trick to make your job a little bit easier is to drill a small pilot hole with a masonry bit before trying to pound the attachment into the concrete. Just make sure the bit is smaller than the nail so you get a tight fit. Attaching to wood is much easier. The clips are attached with nails or screws. Though the nail is usually the quickest, the best attachment is the screw. That's because there's less likelihood of damaging the cable installing the screw than hammering in a nail. A screwed in clip is less likely to pull out if there's any pressure on the drop. There are also clips designed to work with aluminum and vinyl siding. The siding clip locks to the joint between the panels so the siding isn't punctured or dented. For the best results, cable clips should be placed at about 18 inch intervals to hold the cables close to the surface and tightly to the building. Make every effort to keep the cable running in straight lines and allow a proper bend radius for corners and drip loops. Never make a sharp bend in the cable or do anything to it that alters its basic shape. Sharp bends damage the cable. They change the impedance and can actually short out the cable. The average bend should not be less than that of a three inch circle. Remember that the ground block must run horizontally and the drip loops must be on both sides of the block. The ground block should also be attached to the surface of the building using the proper screws or attachments. Use only an approved ground block with dual ground lugs. After routing the cable, route the ground wire to the ground source and attach it to the building using wire clips. Ground wires should be routed directly as possible between the ground block and the ground source. If you aren't exactly sure how you need to ground, refer to the National Electric Code. Remember, it's up to you, the installer, to follow all federal, state, and local codes. Don't subject yourself to the consequences of being in violation of these codes. Now that we have looked at the cable run between the dish and the ground block, let's look down the line towards the IRD. Now we need to get from an exterior surface through the wall to the interior of the home. At this point, you must consider the type of construction of the residence. Is it built on a concrete slab? Does it have a crawl space? Is there a basement? Is there an attic? If there is an attic, is there access to that space? The cable should be routed through the wall so it's at the same level as the rest of the receptacles. The outlet should be placed as close as possible to the receiver to avoid running cable across open areas. Once you've determined the location you'd like to route the cable through, it's time to drill a hole from the inside of the home to the outside. This sounds easy. Just drill a hole and shove the cable through it, right? Wrong. Before you drill, make absolutely certain you know exactly what you are doing. Here's a few pointers. Always drill from the inside out. Even more importantly, make sure you know exactly what's on the exterior wall that you will be drilling through. One way to ensure you know where the exit point will be is simply measure down and across from a window or exterior door. Once the hole has been drilled, you may need a little help getting the cable through. Exterior walls are usually insulated and though the drill bit easily penetrates the insulation, the cable may snag and bend if just pushed through. Here's a tip. 
Take a piece of number 10 ground wire, and after drilling the hole, push the straightened piece of wire through to the exterior of the home. Place the cable through the feed-through bushing and tape the end to the ground wire. Go back in the home and pull the cable through the wall. Go back outside and run a silicone seal around the feed-through bushing and slide it in the hole until it is flush with the surface. Now you should install cable clips to secure the drop. With the outside wiring completed, we move to the interior wiring.